So ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this installation of the Washington Roundtable on Science and Public Policy. That's a continuing series uh, offered by the George Marshall Institute designed to bring the scientific and technical community together with the policymaking community to discuss issues of importance of which ballistic missile defense and space security have been long-running themes of our program. Today's program on the modernization efforts of the Russian of Russia in terms of their uh, ballistic missile as, as well as nuclear modernization programs fit very nicely into this series uh, in the sense that it provides, of course, the most important context uh, for U.S. policy in the missile defense and nuclear modernization era. Understanding what our most uh, important peer competitor is doing uh, in this area ought to inform the policy discussions that will go on in this room and in others like it uh, in the coming months as they consider the as they consider the next year's defense budget, uh, but as well uh, should shape the public's discussion and consideration of missile defense issues uh, and the like. I'm pleased today to have uh, two panelists uh, that, will that will be here to provide commentary on this issue. Paula DeSutter, of course, is not here uh, just yet, but she is on her way. I'll introduce her when she arrives. But our first speaker today is Dr. Mark Snyder, a senior analyst with the National Institute for Public Policy. There he specializes in missile defense, nuclear weapons, deterrence, strategic forces, arms control, and arms control verification and compliance issues. He had served in many positions at the Department of Defense before coming to the National Institute. He was, among others, Principal Director for Forces Policy, the Principal Director for Strategic Defense, Space and Verification Policy, and the Director of Strategic Arms Control Policy. He also served in the Departments of State and Energy, as well as on the staff of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Dr. Snyder, thank you for being here. Thank you uh, very much for uh, having me here. I, I think this is a uh, very important topic, and uh, this uh, and current events really uh, increase uh, its significance. Um, Russia, I believe, overall is, is a very serious strategic challenge uh, to the United States. Uh, Russia under Putin is, has become increasingly anti-democratic uh, and hostile to the United States. Um, in the last uh, five years, uh, Russia has um, invaded two countries, and of course with the Ukrainian situation evolving as uh, as I speak, um, Putin's rationale, as uh, uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has pointed out, is, is very similar to, to that of what Hitler used in the 1930s uh, to justify his actions. Now, of course, Putin is not Hitler. Uh, she didn't intend that meaning uh, either. Uh, the best description I've seen of Putin um, in the Russian press is basically he's a cross between uh, Count Otto von Bismarck and uh, Street Thug. And uh, I think that's actually pretty accurate. Um, according um, to uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, quote, the United States condemns uh, the Russian Federation's invasion and occupation of Ukrainian territory and its violation of Ukrainian um, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And he goes on to list about a half dozen agreements or, or treaties that uh, they're in uh, contravention of because of this. Um, he later went on to talk about the, uh, quote, an incredible act of aggression. It's really stunning. Now, NATO and, and the European uh, Union uh, have uh, denounced um, Russian uh, actions. Uh, but thus far, we haven't seen uh, a lot in, in the way of, of, of action to really um, attempt to, to deter uh, future, at least future Russian actions uh, in, the, in the Ukraine. Um, Russian journalist Alexander Galtz, um, one of the, one, I believe one of uh, the most perceptive uh, Russian journalists um, who actually believes in democracy, uh, characterized um, Putin's actions as follows, and quote, uh, in the span of a few short weeks, Russia has managed to restore the Iron Curtain and launch a military confrontation reminiscent of the worst years of, of the Cold War. Now, Russians, uh, Russian views on nuclear weapons, Russian modernization programs involving nuclear weapons and delivery systems take on their significance because of uh, Russian foreign policy objectives uh, and because of Russian uh, views and doctrine associated with the use of, of nuclear weapons. Um, now, 
unfortunately, um, U.S. policy, I think, is, is based on what amounts to um, um, a couple of fantasies about Russia. And the first one is, and this was stated in, in the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, quote, Russia and the United States are no longer adversaries and the prospects for military confrontation uh, have dramatically uh, declined. Um, then it went on to basically uh, argue that um, maintenance of nuclear parity um, with Russia wasn't very important anymore because of this uh, change in policy. Um, in both the uh, Russian actions in, in Georgia and the Ukraine, uh, the U.S. Uh, unfortunately made no significant effort to deter uh, the events before they happened, uh, and um, no um, real penalty uh, was imposed on Russia for what it did uh, in these situations. And uh, certainly the current actions in the Ukraine are much, uh, much more significant than what happened in Georgia. As a matter of fact, I, if, if you had asked me a few weeks ago whether I thought this was going to happen, I would have said no. Uh, but it has happened, and I think we, we can't uh, ignore uh, what the implications of that are uh, for uh, United States and, and uh, NATO security. Um, under the um, current Russian view of, of nuclear weapons, and this was stated by the third ranking member of the uh, Russian Defense Ministry uh, in, in 2009. Highest priority uh, was given uh, to uh, Russian um, strategic nuclear capability, and second highest priority for defense spending uh, was given to what they call aerospace defense, which in, in reality is, is a strategic uh, missile defense and defense against bombers and cruise missiles and, and uh, even potentially hypersonic um, vehicles. Now, Russian attitudes toward nuclear weapons, I believe, are fundamentally different uh, from anything that exists almost anywhere uh, in the West. Um, they, um, the, the Russians are, um, they have announced um, at the defense minister level uh, in December um, 2010, right after the uh, U.S. Senate ratification or approval of uh, the new STAR Treaty, that their intent was to increase the number of nuclear weapons and delivery systems up to the, the permissible new START level. The problem with that is there's really no new START limit on either of the two uh, because uh, the, of the fact that uh, the new STAR Treaty drastically discounts uh, counting of, of uh, nuclear bombs on uh, or missiles uh, carried by uh, uh, heavy bomber aircraft and, and because there are massive loopholes in the New Star Treaty. For example, the uh, New Star Treaty does not mention rail mobile ICBMs and all the definitions in the treaty were changed uh, to exclude coverage of, of rail mobile ICBMs. And uh, they also eliminated uh, the uh, Star Treaty prohibitions on air-launched ICBMs or surface ship-launched ICBMs. Uh, together, those are uh, very large loopholes uh, that can be exploited to achieve capabilities uh, far in excess of what's notionally permissible uh, under uh, the uh, New Star Treaty. Now, uh, in um, middle, uh, the middle of 2013, President Obama uh, made a major speech in, in Berlin um, in which uh, he uh, called for a negotiated one-third reduction, up to one-third reduction actually was his language, in the number of deployed strategic nuclear uh, weapons from the new START levels. Uh, on the day he um, made the speech, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, rejected future uh, reductions in uh, strategic nuclear weapons. Now, what gives Russian um, um, Russian um, uh, a policy relating to nuclear weapons uh, extreme importance is their nuclear doctrine, and, and it's almost unique um, in the world. Um, their nuclear doctrine permits the use of nuclear weapons in conventional warfare uh, in local and regional uh, conflicts, which they rather amazingly characterize in their doctrinal literature as de-escalation of a conflict. 
That's a rather optimistic view of, of what happens when you start using nuclear weapons. Um, in December 2012, the U.S. National Intelligence Council, which is, works for the Director of National Intelligence, wrote, quote, nuclear ambitions uh, in the U.S. and Russia over the last 20 years have evolved in opposite directions. Reducing the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. A security strategy is the U.S. objective, while Russia uh, is pursuing uh, new um, concepts and capabilities for expanding the role of nuclear weapons in its uh, security strategy, unquote. Uh, in 2009, uh, then commander of the uh, Strategic um, Missile Force, or Strategic Missile Troops is technically called in, in Russia, um, announced what their, basically what their targeting strategy was. And he said, and, and this was subsequently repeated by, uh, by his successor and several other uh, generals in the, in the Strategic Missile Forces, what he said was, in peacetime they, and he's talking about strategic nuclear missiles, are intended to ensure deterrence of large-scale non-nuclear or nuclear aggression against Russia and its allies. In conventional war, they ensure the opponent is forced to cease hostilities uh, on advantageous conditions uh, for Russia by, meani, by means of single or multiple preventive uh, strikes against the aggressor's most important facilities. In nuclear war, they ensure the destruction of facilities of the opponent's military and economic potential by means of an initial massive nuclear missile strike and subsequent multiple and single uh, nuclear missile strikes. Now, this is very important because basically it's a rejection of all Western views about nuclear weapons and their role in, in deterrence uh, really since the 1950s. A uh, core element of Western thinking is that there's a major firebreak uh, between conventional and nuclear uh, weapons use and uh, that the um, consequences of nuclear weapons uh, use uh, are unpredictable and they could be catastrophic. Uh, Russian uh, uh, doctrine on the use of nuclear weapons as stated by their military leadership says uh, rather overtly uh, that once you use nuclear weapons, if we use nuclear weapons, we're going to win uh, and achieve our objectives. Uh, that's a rather optimistic view of what the possibilities uh, are under those circumstances. Uh, Russian um, senior officials, including Putin himself, on several occasions have made direct nuclear threats, including uh, nuclear targeting threats um, and um, the uh, threat of preventive or, pre or preemptive nuclear strikes. Um, uh, this was made against specific nations and, in at least one case, the entire world. Um, Russian um, press reports um, state uh, that their exercises um, uh, almost invariably um, in, the, in the West, the Zapad exercises in the West and, and, and some of the other ones, uh, use the simulated use of nuclear weapons um, in, in almost all, all cases. In the big strategic exercises, which are announced as nuclear um, exercises by um, the Kremlin, um, the, um, the, the exercises routinely involve direct participation of Putin, live missile launches, um, and uh, in the case of the October 2013 uh, exercise, um, you, you had a record number of, of these launches that involved, according to the Russian Defense Ministry, four strategic missiles, ICBMs and SLBMs, uh, four tactical nuclear um, uh, missiles, uh, uh, an, a live ABM interceptor launch, and a dozen surface-to-air missile launches. So basically, they appear here to have a simulated, uh, you know, full-scale nuclear war. And this is done on an annual uh, basis. Um, the open source information uh, we have on actual Russian uh, strategic nuclear modernization uh, programs um, is largely from the Russian government uh, itself and secondarily, um, although some frequently in more detail, by Russian um, press stories. We get almost no information other than three numbers uh, which are aggregated and not very useful um, from uh, the New Star Treaty. We still have useful data in the old STAR Treaty uh, Memorandum of, of Agreement, but that's now five years out of date, so it's, it's of decreasing 
uh, utility. So there, uh, there is some significant uncertainty. Now, the Obama administration doesn't talk very much about Russian uh, strategic nuclear programs. If you do a lot of research, you can confirm uh, at least the thrust of what the Russians say uh, they are doing uh, in, the, uh, in the nuclear area, and uh, in particularly the strategic nuclear area. Uh, Russia maintains five uh, legacy um, ICBMs and SOBMs from the uh, Soviet period. Uh, it's modernized one of them, the SSN-23, and, and uh, they have stated they've tested what they call an advanced combat payload on the SS-19. That's reportedly in the Russian press a hypersonic boost glide vehicle. Uh, but the core of the programs are actual actual new systems, uh, things, systems that didn't exist that, during the Cold War um, that have been developed subsequent, tested subsequent, and, and deployed subsequent to the end of the Cold War. And that's literally most of what the Russians are doing. I divide these into uh, the, the Yeltsin legacy programs and things that have been announced since basically uh, December 2010 when uh, the U.S. Senate ratified um, the uh, New Star Treaty. Now, the, the Yeltsin legacy uh, systems include the uh, new SS-27 ICBM, uh, originally a single warhead, um, then merged under, under Putin, um, and there's a lot of evidence that this is a Star Treaty violation. Um, they have um, developed and tested uh, with, in many cases, unsuccessful results in, in case of the missile, the the Bull of a 30 SLBM, uh, and um, the, uh, they have introduced into, into the Russian Navy service the uh, Bore class submarines, a couple of them, um, that they um, will carry the missile on. Uh, they plan eight of the uh, Bore class submarines carrying uh, 16 Bull of a 30s each. They have introduced, and the Obama administration has con confirmed this, the KH 102 long range nuclear outcome. Uh, which uses uh, uh, some stealth technology. And they've uh, produced uh, a, a, a small number of additional uh, TU-160 uh, heavy bombers uh, in contravention um, of a commitment made as part of their 1991-1992 presidential um, nuclear uh, initiatives. Um, since um, 2010, um, we have had the Russian government announce large increases, um, factor four actually, in, in uh, the, uh, uh, their numbers for this year. Uh, in the number of, of ICBMs and SLBMs um, they are uh, producing. Uh, Putin in 2012 uh, said that they um, intend to add or produce um, 400 new ICBMs and, and, and uh, the Russians use the term ICBMs to refer to both ICBMs as we use the, the word and, and SLBMs uh, by 2020. Um, and uh, they've announced a series of, of um, new ICBM programs uh, starting uh, about December 2010. Uh, the current pattern of Russian modernization suggests we're going to see um, um, additional missiles beyond the ones that they talk most about, uh, probably uh, in the 2020s. Uh, the announced program involves uh, modernization of 98% of the uh, ground-based ICBM force by uh, 2021. Th they have announced a new uh, heavy bomber, um, which um, uh, would be um, deployed uh, probably around uh, 2025 if they're successful and at uh, 2030 if they're less successful in the development program. Uh, the current pattern of, of modernization um, uh, basically uh, is one in which we will see complete modernization of Russian strategic forces before we modernize anything um, in the U.S. Uh, arsenal. Uh, the Obama administration has confirmed that, they're de that they are deploying several substantially uh, new MIRV uh, ICBMs and SLBMs that listed uh, the SS-27 under the Russian name, the Yars, uh, the new Bore class submarine uh, and the Bull of a 30, and a new heavy ICBM. The heavy ICBM, I think, is, is uh, in all probability the most significant development we've, we've seen because it, it's literally a... Um, a resurrection of uh, 
the most uh, disturbing of, of the Soviet um, um, Cold War uh, ICBM uh, programs. New missile they've now recently called the, the Sarmat. Russian press reports it'll carry uh, 10 heavy or 15 uh, medium um, warheads. The head of, of the, of the, of the uh, strategic missile troops says it'll also have a conventional warhead option on it. Um, recently retired major general who headed up the um, fourth Central Research Institute, uh, which is uh, deeply involved with their nuclear programs, uh, says that it's capable of attacking the United States over the South Pole. Now, that to me suggests they may very well have resurrected uh, the Soviet era fractional orbital bombardment system, because uh, that's the easiest way to, to do that sort of thing. Uh, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if, 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 if that's um, not the case. Now, the Russians have um, also um, announced the, the testing, and they, they say they're going to deploy this year of a new ICBM. They've recently uh, started calling the RS-26. Um, it's referred to frequently as a reduced range uh, ICBM uh, in Russia. It appears to be a really what amounts to an IRBM missile uh, designed to replace the uh, the SS-20 eliminated by the INF Treaty. It may technically be an ICBM. Uh, if what they're saying is true, they claim it flew to 5,600 kilometers during the first test, but all subsequent testing um, has been to INF um, ranges. Um, at a minimum, it's a major circumvention of, of the INF Treaty, and it could end up um, uh, being a new start violation if, if some of the press reports in Russia about it are true. Now, when this is put in the context of a number of other Russian actions relating to the INF Treaty, uh, it appears uh, very much that um, the Russians are recreating uh, the Soviet era uh, intermediate range uh, nuclear force. This includes a um, cruise missile, um, which the um, Obama administration has, has confirmed. Um, as being tested um, in, in, in a way that appears, quote, inconsistent with the INF Treaty. Uh, and there are a number of other issues uh, of INF compliance. So we could very well end up with um, the, the Russians having um, capabilities uh, that, are uh, that literally are not supposed to exist anymore through a combination of violations and circumventions of the treaty. Now, uh, one Russian journalist actually says that um, the Soviets considered something he called a pseudo-ICBM, which is a 6,000-kilometer range ICBM, uh, which really can't perform an ICBM mission. But uh, the missile, quote, did not make it through the filter of international acceptance. Now Putin has done ex exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, there hasn't been a peep out of the U.S. government, uh, the, any NATO government that I know about, um, and uh, the U.S. arms control enthusiast community. Now, um, Russia has also announced uh, at the senior level on several occasions, actually, uh, the development of the new rail mobile ICBM. That's significant because uh, the New Star Treaty doesn't say a word about rail mobile ICBMs and all the definitions uh, that it, uh, dealt with them in, in the Star Treaty have either been changed to exclude them or deleted completely. Uh, right now, uh, if they put a, uh, ICBMs uh, on uh, rail mobile launchers, effectively they don't count under the Star Treaty unless the Russians agree uh, to a treaty amendment. And oh, by the way, about uh, a week or two ago, uh, there was an article in the Russian press uh, saying uh, that they may change the missile on this, and it may be the RS-26. Now, uh, if they do that, um, they've got an SS-20 equivalent uh, completely outside of any arms control uh, constraints. Uh, in 2013, uh, General, Colonel General retired Alexander Zelen, who was the former chief of the Russian Air Force, um, now an advisor in, in, to the, the Minister of Defense, uh, indicated in a briefing he gave that Russia will deploy a, um, uh, a air-launched uh, ICBM. Uh, 
In addition to that, we now have uh, perhaps as many as six missiles that are mentioned in the Russian press uh, that I would call, um, using uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's terminology, known unknowns. The, these include, uh, in, in terms of the most significant ones, uh, a new medium ICBM, uh, YARSAM, whatever that is, and something they're characterizing as a super heavy ICBM capable of carrying 15 heavy nuclear warheads. Now, some of these uh, may be names for other names for some of the systems we know about, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if um, one or two of them turn out uh, to be real um, additional programs that show up in, in the uh, in the 2020s. Um, they have, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry has uh, released, uh, signed a contract for the development of a fifth generation missile submarine. We don't know much about it other than the Russian press is saying it'll carry both ballistic and, and uh, cruise missiles and, and the reported uh, date uh, for, for this thing to appear is 20, uh, 2020. They've also signed a contract for a new um, heavy bomber, uh, it's being described in the Russian press as a stealth bomber similar to the, the B-2. It's going to carry cruise missiles, according to Putin, and recent re uh, press reports say it'll carry hypersonic missiles. Um, this could be available as early as 2025, possibly uh, 2030 or, or later. Uh, the Russian um, Defense Ministry uh, officials have uh, stated on many occasions that they're developing new types of nuclear weapons. Um, Russian press reports indicate uh, that these um, uh, range from uh, um, new uh, very high yield thermonuclear warheads for the missiles through, through MIRV, uh, lightweight MIRV warheads, uh, through precision low yield nuclear warheads and uh, low collateral damage designs. Uh, Rush, about three Russian press reports indicate that they're in the process of deploying some of uh, what they call precision low yield weapons, uh, 50 to 200 tons nuclear yield uh, on uh, strategic missiles. Now, um, in 2011, the Obama administration said the Russians had between four and 6,500 uh, nuclear weapons, 4,000 and 6,500 nuclear weapons. Um, this is actually lower. Uh, than many Russian estimates of, of their capability. itar TASS, which of course is the main official news agency, stated in, in, in 2009 they probably had between 15 and 17,000 uh, nuclear warheads. Um, there is substantial evidence uh, that um, the um, Russians have not met their commitments uh, under the presidential nuclear initiatives of 1991-1992 concerning tactical nuclear weapons, and they're actually modernizing battlefield nuclear capability, including the Iskander M, which the third ranking member in the, in the Russian Defense Ministry who dealt with procurement at the time said was nuclear capable. Um, they uh, maintain, according to the Obama administration, uh, on the order of uh, 10 times as many tactical nuclear weapons um, as we do. Um, and. Um, there are other indications they're being modernized. For example, in 2012, Zelen, he, at the time he was the chief of the Russian Air Force, said the new Su-34 long-range strike fighter uh, is going to be given a uh, nuclear cruise missile and so it could participate in, in the Air Force uh, strategic aviation. Um, if that happens, it's a, a new start violation in, in the making. There's a little question about that. Now, Russia um, is uh, deploying what it calls an aerospace defense system, which is, in effect, what we would call a missile defense system, uh, anti-satellite and, and uh, bomber uh, defense, cruise missile defense uh, capability. Um, the Russians have announced the Moscow ABM system is going to be modernized with the A-235 system. Um, and um, they have indicated they've tested uh, an experimental uh, ABM interceptor, which presumably is part of that uh, system. Three senior generals in the aerospace uh, defense troops, including its commander, um, say that Russian surface-to-air missiles are going to take over the mission of intercepting ICBMs and SLBM warheads. And two of them specifically mentioned the S-500 system, which is currently uh, under development. 
Now, the, the, the Russians um, are also uh, significantly upgrading uh, their uh, bomber defense, cruise missile defense capability. They've announced um, that um, they uh, are de deploying 56 battalions of S-400, which is a new surface-to-air missile, primarily um, bomber defense, uh, but with secondary capabilities against medium-range uh, ballistic missiles. Uh, they've announced 10 um, battalions of S-500s by 2020. Uh, that um, we don't really know for sure exactly what the, their battalions uh, will consist of, but uh, based on, on one article, it, it would appear that uh, they're going to deploy at least 10 times the number uh, of ABM interceptors that, that we are planning to do, although their capabilities will be less in, in terms of, of range. But uh, since they're uh, going to be a mobile uh, system, they're actually going to be substantially more survivable than, than our capability uh, is. Uh, they are in deploying and operating uh, interceptor aircraft, uh, new designs uh, based on the um, Su-35, uh, 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 which is now in, in early stages uh, of being uh, uh, produced, and the uh, uh, miss a, a interceptor aircraft or fighter aircraft, really, that they call the uh, PAC-FA, which is uh, what they characterize as a fifth-generation uh, fighter. Now. All in all, we, I think we face a very significant uh, threat that we're not doing very much to, to deal with. The Obama administration wants to do more arms control with the Russians. Um, lots of luck, but uh, the Russians won't even agree uh, to negotiations, much less any sort of outcome along the lines the Obama administration wants. Uh, U.S. Um, nuclear modernization programs are minimal. Um, we. Um, are basically replacing systems uh, only when they're 40 to 80 years of, of age. Um, we um, won't have any uh, new systems um, in operation, and, and that's under the optimistic assumption that budget cuts don't derail this, um, which could very easily be the case. But assuming everything went perfectly and we actually had the funding, just about uh, nothing will be operational before the late uh, 2020. So basically, we're talking about a 15-year decline in uh, in our capabilities, with only uh, minimal sustainment and, and only very even more minor uh, improvements uh, in capabilities. Um, the administration um, would like to uh, limit tactical nuclear weapons. The Russians have said no, at least um, without a series of U.S. concessions. Um, um, that no administration, including the Obama administration, would be willing to make. Um, and uh, even, even then, uh, that's their conditions for talking about uh, limitations, not agreeing to limitations. Now, well, what does this all mean? Well, we know that Putin is going to run Russia for the foreseeable future. He, he may very well turn out to be um, president for, for life. Um, and uh, we know he's um, willing to use force uh, to achieve uh, his objectives. How far he goes, I don't know. Nobody does. Uh, but uh, we could be in a confrontation with, with, uh, with this uh, gentleman uh, within uh, this decade uh, if, he, if he thinks he can get away with a, uh, an attack on, on, on a NATO country. And uh, he may very well think that in, in light of the way we're reacting to what he's, he's already done. Now, uh, Secretary of um, Defense, or prior, uh, first Secretary of Defense under the Obama administration, uh, Robert Gates, um, recently wrote um, that, uh, quote, as we reduce the size of our nuclear arsenal, we potentially get down to numbers that having allies who have their own nuclear capability could be very useful, unquote. I don't find that very reassuring. Um, I don't think we can rely on the British and French, uh, French for uh, our nuclear deterrent. And oh, by the way, the French have never made a uh, nuclear guarantee to anybody and almost certainly never will. Um, NATO, uh, in, in the area of good news, uh, NATO has decided it's going to remain a, a nuclear alliance. Um, 
However, uh, again, uh, capabilities are very small in number and, and low in readiness, and uh, modernization is, is far down uh, the pike. Um, Bomb administration has delayed the introduction of nuclear capability on the F-35 until uh, 2025. Uh, so we are going to be uh, faced um, in the in the 2020s uh, with a uh, radically rearmed um, Russian Federation. They claim uh, that by 2020 they will modernize 70 percent of their conventional forces in addition to all the uh, nuclear. Uh, Modernization I've been I've been talking about. Uh, they'll never make that um, in the sense that uh, all their uh, dates, at least the initial ones, turn out um, to be uh, at least several years uh, more optimistic than than what actually happens. But the overall trend uh, is uh, toward very substantial modernization and uh, uh, Russian superiority along most of its border. Uh, where it faces um, um, states with, with fairly minimal uh, military capability, and this could be very tempting um, to Putin. Well, that concludes my uh, prepared presentation. Thank you. So this yeah. is Paula de Sutter. <coughs> she uh, was the U.S. Uh, Assistant Secretary for State for Verification, Compliance, and Implementation from 2002 and 2009, first person to hold that position. Uh, prior uh, to joining the State Department, she served on the staff of the U.S. Senate Selecting Committee on Intelligence, serving as a staff liaison for Senator Kyle, and responsible for legislation and oversight of intelligence collection analysis and activities related to proliferation, terrorism, arms control, the Persian Gulf states, and a number uh, of others. She also worked uh, for several years at the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, uh, and she is here today to talk to us about how I think uh, a different State Department might react to the circumstances that Mark just laid out. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be here. I need to correct something. I was not the first Assistant Secretary oh. of State for Verification and Compliance. Um, a Dr. Owen J. Sheeks was actually my predecessor. He, he wasn't in the position very long because it took a long time for the State Department to finally agree to comply with the legislation that created the Bureau. Um, all of which they have now reversed. They're still within the law, but they've changed virtually everything that the Bureau was intended to do. Um, meaning, having a focus on verification and compliance. They've now turned it into the Arms Control Negotiating Bureau. And for a long time, it, it was clear to most observers that um, having the verifiers commingled with the negotiators was a bad idea because no negotiator on the face of the planet would enjoy having to make the, the tough decisions about verification a priority. So that said, um, I wanted to, I, I actually threw out what I had written before and, and started around midnight last night with something I I wanted to talk about instead of my original thought. Um, and that is, we can learn from the past. So I'm going to start with the basic concept, which is simply put, the purpose of U.S. foreign policy is to induce other nations to behave in a manner consistent with U.S. interests and to deter them from acting in a manner inconsistent with those interests. America has an array of tools to try to achieve the purposes of foreign policy, economic, technological, moral, military, diplomatic, um, cultural. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just occurred to me that we should send Moscow Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a tool I hadn't thought of before, but it might be effective. We might have Putin crying uncle rather rapidly. One additional tool is the use of negotiated arms control agreements. In arms control, the United States trades away its freedom of action to secure national security based on the premise that the other party will comply. If the premise that America's treaty partners are complying is false, two options exist. Option one, ignore or tolerate the violation. Option two, respond to reverse the violation or deny the violator all benefits from his violation. 
Russian behavior in the international arena, including modernization of their forces, both legally and illegally, pose serious threats to America. But we've dealt with the mentality and the resulting behaviors of the current Russian regime before. And I believe that we can look at the actions taken back in the 1980s in response to Soviet noncompliance for lessons to identify the problem and develop a strategy and actions to either stop the unacceptable Russian actions or unilaterally deny them the benefits of their misbehavior. The documents on this history are in some cases obscure, and I'm trying to think about how to try to make some of them available. I, I was going through so many of them last night that I thought, oh, people, people need to have a set of these because you might be geeks too. Um, in the summer of 1984, I started working as a graduate intern in the Verification and Intelligence Bureau at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Under the direction of Dr. Manfred Eimer, I was asked to help with the analysis of Soviet noncompliance. In no small part, thanks to or curse him forever, Dr. Mark Schneider, um, I started working in the Bureau as a full-time employee in 1985. I had asked Mark, you know, how do you get a job in Washington? He says, well, how, how do you like working for Dr. Eimer? How do you like verification? I said, oh, I love it. I love this. Intel, policy, um, law, all coming together in one place. He said, well, why don't you ask Fred Eimer for a job? I go, oh, can you do that? He goes, yeah. Um, and I did. And I started a long and dark history <laughs> called my career. I wouldn't quite put it that way. Well, there have been moments. Yes. <clears throat> the Reagan administration learned through intelligence reports that a dark picture was emerging of Soviet noncompliance with its arms control obligations. And it became clear that a pattern of Moscow's noncompliance had to be figured into the U.S. approach to arms control. The executive branch issued its first report on Soviet noncompliance in January 1984, the first comprehensive historical analysis of Soviet noncompliance was prepared for the president by the General Advisory Committee to the President on Arms Control, or the GAC, as it's called. The GAC report was prepared at the code word level and issued as an unclassified report in October 1984. And many of us have spent way too much time trying to get it released, and it's one of those things that just never seems to happen. What emerged from all these reports was evidence that while the Soviet Union had not violated every arms control agreement to which they were a party, the ones they hadn't violated were those agreements that only banned things no nation would want to do anyway, such as the Antarctic Treaty or the Seabed Treaty. If, however, <clears throat> the Soviet Union could save a few rubles or gain strategic or tactical advantage, they violated their obligations. And it really was, there, some of their serious violations were, were simply things that they knew, they knew it was a violation. I'm, I'm thinking about the venting of nuclear debris, uh, which violated the limited test ban treaty. And the United States even said, look, we will help you with containment measures so that this debris doesn't go outside your national territory, um, which would have been a safety and health boon to the Soviet people and also to those outside the country. And they simply didn't want to bother. So <clears throat> while earlier administrations had responded to Soviet noncompliance by ignoring or legitimizing them, and that might require comment. Um, there were several instances with the ABM Treaty where the United States would identify a violation and go talk to the Soviets, and the Soviets said, mm, maybe it's illegal, but we're not changing what we're doing. And so they would write a common understanding that legitimized it and said, Okay, but this is the only time you get to do that. Um, but urged by Congress, and that's important, Congress was a strong player 
in all of the, the policy development during the Reagan administration. Um, so urged on by Congress, the Reagan administration refused to ignore or legitimize the activities. The Reagan administration issued additional compliance reports at least every year. And they also put out special publications. We had ACTA put out this uh, brochure or a white paper where we could try to say in an unclassified way as much as possible with photographs. The Pentagon put out the Soviet military power publications. Um, and so there was, a, there was a huge effort to get the information out. In addition, President Reagan raised noncompliance issues in every single bilateral meeting he had with his Russian counterpart. Secretary Schultz did the same thing. Every single bilat had a major component, not, not just a, oh, by the way, I, I meant to mention noncompliance. No, it was a part of the conversation, and it was a serious part of the conversation. So we, they had escalated as much as possible through diplomatic channels what could be done. On June 10th, 1985, President Reagan signed a National Security Decision Directive on building an interim framework of mutual restraint. In it, he acknowledged the problem of Soviet noncompliance and expressed the hope that noncompliance would be corrected. At the same time, he directed a number of studies to prepare the United States to take appropriate responses and called on the Soviet Union to join the U.S. in a policy of mutual restraint on strategic offensive arms. He outlined a U.S. force buildups that could have been undertaken at that time, but were not. So the message was, okay, we are getting pretty fed up with this. We may have to start looking at our own offensive forces and other changes to compensate for what you're doing in the strategic arena. We're not staying like this forever. Um, less than, just under a year later, on May 27th, 1986, President Reagan announced that there was a new U.S. interim restraint policy responding to Soviet arms control violations. And I, I'm not sure if these are on the state website, but it's um, State Department Special Report Number 147. In that policy statement, he said, as part of the same decision last June to continue interim restraint, I also announced that we would take appropriate and proportionate responses when needed to protect our own security in the face of continuing Soviet noncompliance. It is my view that certain steps are now required by continued Soviet disregard for their obligations. Needless to say, the most essential near-term response to Soviet noncompliance remains the implementation of our full strategic modernization program to underwrite deterrence today and the continued pursuit of the Strategic Defense Initiative Research Program to see if it is possible to provide a safer and more stable basis for our future security and that of our allies. The SDI program represents our best hope for a future in which our security can rest upon the increasing contribution of defensive systems that threaten no one. It's all starting to sound a little familiar in terms of what, what one would expect an administration to do. But given all these activities, before the end of the Reagan administration, many, if not most, of the major Soviet violations had been reversed. And after many years of raising violations with Soviet representatives, they stopped work on the Krasnoyarsk radar, which was the, the single biggest violation. It was a, a finger in America's eye. And yet no one has ever brought me a little piece of the radar. Because <laughs> it hasn't ever been dismantled. Yeah, but oh, people have yeah. been there. They could bring me a little crumbled <laughs> brick. You know. Anyway, <clears throat> so what can we learn from all that? in addition to the fact that if anyone ever gets to the Krasnoyarsk radar in the Soviet Union, they might want to think about a gift <laughs> for me. All right, lessons learned. Lesson number one. This is what John Bolton uh, liked to call naming names. 
one of the things the administration did, in some cases more effectively than others, was to make uh, the public and our allies informed to the maximum degree about the nature and, and uh, of the threat posed by Soviet violations. We were frequently condemned for doing so, not only by the Soviets, but by the arms control apologensia. And it's, it's one of those things that if you didn't live through it, it's really hard to believe um, how people in the arms control advocacy community despised, hated the administration making public the Soviet violations. And it was never, they were never angry at the Soviet Union for violating. They were angry at us for reporting it. So at least in these days, you wouldn't have the same kind of problem. But one, of, one small caveat, if someone decided to take this approach, um, is that each and every time the United States charged the Soviet Union with a violation, they always came back and they tried to charge us with a violation that was as close as possible to what we had charged them with. So if one were to start doing this, you, you have to anticipate it. So part of what I'm saying is this administration should be naming names. And not only are they not doing that, they're showing not much inclination to do it in the future. So they have to be, they have to be pushed to do that. Lesson two. <coughs> Congress is a force multiplier. If the executive branch and Congress work together, or at least toward common goals, the odds of success in trying to get Russia to change their behavior is far greater than under any other circumstance. During the Reagan administration, the Soviet Union lobbied Congress hard against our verification compliance and enforcement efforts. It, it was pretty blatant. Um, importantly, their efforts didn't work. They had a few small successes, but nothing long. They invited some congressmen <clears throat> to go out to see this, the Krasnodar's radar, and when the congressman came back, they said, you know, they start, you know, you know congressmen, they decided to make their public announcements before they had talked to, to people who knew a little bit more. And they said, hell, violation, this thing isn't even operational. Well, it turns out that under the ABM Treaty, one of the few things done well is that the minute they started pouring concrete for that radar, it was a violation. And so the congressman backed off and, and that went away, but that was the kind of thing that, that they were doing. In February 1987, the Senate passed a resolution by a vote of 93 to 2, which quote, declares that an important obstacle to the achievement of acceptable arms control agreements with the Soviet Union has been its violation of existing agreements and calls upon it to take steps to rectify its violation of such agreements and in particular to dismantle the newly constructed radar site at Krasnyarsk, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, since it is in clear violation of the terms of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Then on May 6, 1987, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 416 to 0 in support of a resolution recognizing that by constructing the Krasnodarsk radar, the Soviet Union violated its legal obligations under the ABM Treaty. More than a decade later, I was working on the SSCI, and one of my colleagues there, who had long worked on the Hill, and I were talking about noncompliance. And he mentioned that his primary experience with the topic had been when the senator he was working for uh, directed him to staff the development and passage of some stupid, worthless resolution saying that Krasnyarsk radar was a violation. And I told him that in meetings of standing consultative commission, and in the ABM Treaty Review in 1988, I waived those resolutions in front of the Soviet counterparts. And I said, look, America wants these violations to stop and we want them reversed. This is not just 
one guy at the White House. It is the American public represented by their representatives, and we want it to stop. And I'm telling you, it had an effect. I mean, they got so nervous, and not as bad as when I did the whole lighter thing, but, um, but it was meaningful. And so here the folk, you know, someone who had worked hard to pass the resolution said, it's basically just a sense of the Senate resolution that has no effect. It had an effect. It was a useful tool. So lesson three, Con Congress has to exert direct and indirect pressure on the executive branch and on other nations. Without the support of the White House, Congress can still have a huge impact in the effort to bring violators back into compliance or to respond to deny violators the benefits of their cheating. A three-prong approach is required. First, direct pressure to sway the executive branch into action. Second, action to generate other pressures on the executive branch. And third, supporting and funding military programs that deny the violator the benefits of their violations. I know that, that those who've worked in this town for a long time have seen many, many letters from groups of congressmen or senators to the president. I really believe that these have an effect. Um, when I was at the State Department, I know that if there was a letter, especially a letter with the right number of signatures on it um, to the Secretary of State, the Secretary had to sit up and take notice. Didn't mean that each, you know, one letter changed the course of human history, but it was, it was a tool that had some effect. Um, calling executive branch political appointees to appear before Congress to address these problems. And I know that it, it takes a lot of time. It's hard to get, you know, a hearing scheduled on a topic like that when you're in the budget season. So sometimes you can do staff briefings, but hauling their asses up here is a good thing to do. And every single political appointee made commitments in their confirmation process that they would respond when called call them, haul them up here. That means that their staffs are going to spend a week or two drafting points that won't make Congress angry, and those will be cleared through the entire bureaucracy. By doing that, by focusing the questions, you are indeed changing the terms of the debate. You've got to do it consistently and, you know, there was, a, there was a gentleman that worked in the Senate named Dave Sullivan, and he used to torture me. <laughs> Look how happy this makes Mark Schneider. <laughs> he, he used to torture me I with had to answer his questions, too. <laughs> I mean, he would send 100 questions, and they may only be on five topics, yes. but he would word them different ways so he could try to catch you because he figured they'd be farmed out. Well, let me tell you, he had our attention. You know, 15 or 30 of us in the bureaucracy that are working one issue were focused on doing nothing but getting his questions answered. It works. You may make enemies, but if you're a conservative Republican up here, nobody in the bureaucracy is going to like you anyway. So go ahead. Um, I think that um, there, there are opportunities to defund White House priorities in non-related areas. Um, things like State Department employees really like to go do negotiations in nice places. Okay. Geneva, The Hague, I mean, they're Vienna. They like it. Well, see if you can defund something so that they're not getting to go, they're not getting to stay quite as long, you know, targeted little torture devices. That gets their attention. Um, 
And one of the one of the most important things is to make sure that the executive branch knows, and this will take a little bit more time, that they have to know that the probability of gaining Senate advice and consent to ratification of any new agreements is not going to happen while these other things are going on. The, the problem with the Obama administration is that um, they've decided to take the, the White House approach with issuing executive orders as opposed to, you know, working with Congress on the laws. And they're trying to, they want to do that, and they've told the Russians they want to do that on arms control arrangements. And among other things, that means that, that staffers are going to have to pay a lot more attention to um, things like experts' meetings. Um, and they're not putting out very detailed statements of what it is they've been up to. Uh, now and then, they'll, they'll give a speech and go ahead and put it on the state website. And those are really useful. So <clears throat> the other thing is, the legislation that created my old bureau um, has two sections, one that talks about an annual compliance report and the other one that talks about verifiability assessments. Um, it's USC section 2593A and 2577. And the focus has been on um, the compliance reports, which are, are frankly so bad that I would have been embarrassed to put out the kind of junk they're putting out. Um, but the mandate for that report calls for an awful lot of other material that's never included in them. I never included them because I didn't want to. But they could be forced to. Nobody ever called me on it. Um, things like, what is your overall approach? You know, what, what are you proposing to other countries? And in terms of verifiability, the right members and committees can task them with doing a verifiability assessment on proposals the United States has made to other countries or that they have made to us. So there may be more tools in there. And like questions, for the record, um, demanding those re you know, reports under existing law can be very effective. I mean, I think that adding new reports to the legislation, I, I think that's wearisome, but I think that better advantage can be taken of uh, the existing legislation. The whole time I was uh, Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance, which was from 2002 to 2009, I never had to write a verifiability assessment. Now, that was in part because some of my friends up here, I would go, please don't make me do that. You know, I'd rather break my fingernails. But they can be forced to do that and forced to address some of these big issues. Like, how are you going to verify tactical weapons you know, agreements? Mark mentioned earlier that you know, the idea of trying to, to reduce tactical nuclear weapons. My big fear is that Russia will say, oh, yes, no preconditions. We will enter into those negotiations with you. And from what we've seen with, with New START and everything else, I don't see that coming out in our favor. So indirect actions. These are things that are aimed at the executive branch. But the fulcrum is public attention, getting other nations to put pressure on the White House and putting pressure on the violators. Um, I guess my successor in my bureau didn't raise, didn't tell the NATO allies about the Russian violation of the INF Treaty until it had been well known for at least three years. Um, that's not a good way to do it, especially if you want them to become your allies in trying to put pressure. Um, resolutions and floor statements by members, press interviews, constituent communication, funding adjustments targeting the violator and other nations um, can help lend support. 
Congress can meet with representatives of the violating nation, either with the ambassador in Washington or during CODELs. And Congress can write to parliamentary members of the violating nation or other nations. In other words, taking naming names up to a whole new level. And then finally, President Reagan acknowledged the importance of missile defenses as an appropriate and proportionate response to violations of offensive force limitations. And funding uh, U.S. missile defense efforts, real ones, not just, you know, build-a-bear activities in some places, are, are really important. Getting back to real missile defenses that really shoot down real missiles, regardless of who lobs them at us. Those of you who've heard me, just, I just think it's remarkable that we've ended up with this idea that it's okay to try to shoot down a, an Iranian or a North Korean ballistic missile, but we've made commitments to, to Russia and China that our missile defenses aren't intended to, won't be designed for shooting down their missiles, as if it's okay to get nuked by them. Well, it's not okay to get nuked by anybody. So, you know, things like that can get turned around. So, at the beginning of my remarks, I noted that if the premise that America's treaty partners are complying is false, two options exist. Option one, ignore or tolerate the violation. Option two, respond to reverse the violation or deny the violator all benefits from his violation. Option one, don't do anything, is far easier. The costs of taking option one are never in the short term. They're in the long term. They're in the credibility of America, the credibility of an arms control process, the credibility of deterrence. We say the line is here, don't cross it. If you draw a line in the sand with an arms control agreement and they step over it and you tell them to stop and they step over it, you tell them to stop and they step over it, there is no line in the sand you fundamentally undermine deterrence. And that could have an effect when you say, don't deploy that weapon system. Don't sell that weapon system to Iran. So option one is easier. The costs are not now. The costs are in the long term. Option two is difficult and it's costly. And the costs are in the near term. But, and the benefits of option two are in the long term, not the near term. That means that any effort to try to do this is going to be fundamentally really hard. And it takes a commitment to national security, to deterrence, um, and it's difficult to ask members to do these things. They've got an awful lot on their plate. When I was working for Senator Kyle, I always thought C-SPAN should follow that man for a week. You know, I couldn't follow him for a week. I couldn't keep up with him going down the hallway, but that's another problem. Here I am in my little heels. So um, anyway, I, I think that the the administration's acknowledgement of the Russian violations of the INF Treaty are a significant, uh, is a significant event because they've hidden it for a long time. They are apparently doing nothing about it. They hid it for a long time, not only from Congress, but from our allies. And aside from a couple of meetings that Rose Gottmuller has had, I have seen no effort to try to bring them back into compliance. None. So my conclusion is, as in so many areas of, of national and foreign policy right now, um, it's up to people outside the White House community. It's up to people on the Hill to try to take the action 
they can take and make a big difference. And there are a lot of things that you can do. And unlike with the Reagan administration, who was doing all this for the first time ever, that's not going to be the case for people that are trying to fight it now. And so with that, I will close. Thank you both. <clears throat> While you think of questions you'd like to pose uh, to our speakers, I'll ask the first one. And it, I want to build off of, Paula, your, your uh, effort or your admonition that we should name names. I think you said that we should make the public and allies aware of the threat posed by these kinds of violations. So to the extent that you heard most of Mark's presentation and he, and he named bio, uh, violations of both the INF and the New START Treaty, what are, for both of you, what are the threats posed by that? I think the, the notion of nuclear weapons and nuclear warfare is such an abstraction in the modern national security parlance that the implications of it may not be uh, as as appreciated as they were in the 1980s. And then given what your answer is to the threats, what do we do about that? This administration apparently may not do anything about it, but what could we do if we wanted to do something about it? Well, I would start by saying that the INF Treaty really was, I mean, it, it, it and the Limited Test Ban Treaty remain in my mind two of the best and most important arms control agreements. Um, the INF Treaty, from a verification standpoint, was very, very good. And it was made good. Brian Smith, who works here on, on HIPSI, just left. But Brian was instrumental in developing the verification regime for the INF Treaty. They called it an interlocking web of constraints. And the Reagan administration did not go forward with the INF Treaty um, without making sure that it was stringent and was in our interest because we had the, the record of noncompliance. So a part of the danger of this is that we had, you know, the INF Treaty was in our outbox. It was a, a level and type of threat to which we didn't have to worry anymore. You don't get those real often. Look, we don't have to worry about this. And now, they've generated the whole thing again when unlike 1983 or four, there's, it, it's hard to get motivated to try to deal with it. But there's also the, I, I was gonna say the term slippery slope but my arms control friends love that phrase. It's a slippery slope. Shoot your foot, self in the foot. Um, failure to deter in one level has consequences for others. I think that it, you could point to this INF violation and you can go back and you can say, this is almost certainly a product of our failure to do anything about the Russian decision to not implement the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. They totally got away with that. Nobody did anything, major international agreement, and they just said, we're not doing it anymore. And so you, you have this you know, area of threat that we're no longer focused on addressing. You have the second serious denial by Russia of um, commitment to, to comply. And at the same time, we're seeing again no serious response by this administration. Which means what? It means you're going to find further, further violations. You're going to have more of them and other nations notice. When one of the things that I regret um, during the, the Reagan administration is that I don't think, I mean, we, we did focus hard on the ABM Treaty. I don't believe that we put sufficient effort um, at going after the Soviet biological weapons program. And, you know, we, we raised it, we made it public, but we didn't do enough. And so the Soviet Union, kept its offensive biological weapon program, which was massive, 
massive. They still have that program, but they've sort of tailored it and uh, made it more efficient, I fear. But you can see in the years following our failure to, to bring them back into compliance with the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, a proliferation of biological weapons programs around the world. And so, you know, one of the things about responding is pay now or pay later. And as you look at the countries like Syria, like Iran, that have at North Korea biological weapons programs, we're paying now. And it, it, we haven't paid the full price, but there could be some very ugly prices. And so I think that those threats are there. And what you do about it is you start naming names, making them public, acknowledge that you're not going to get what you want from the executive branch, and so try to force them to do, to, to address it. Through those means. To Through identify. those means. Yeah. You know, invite Rose Gottmuller to a debate, not with me, <laughs> um, on, you know, or to come give a speech on, you know, does, does compliance matter? Sure. Force them to address it. So that's where I go. Okay, in, in a purely uh, military sense, uh, if the Russians continue um, along the lines uh, that they are apparently uh, doing right now in, in relation to the INF Treaty, you're going to have essentially the recreation of the pre-INF Treaty um, Russian um, or Soviet uh, intermediate range uh, nuclear capability. It'll be on a smaller scale, obviously. We no longer uh, talk about thousands of weapons. Uh, you, we talk more about hundreds of weapons, but you're going to have um, a considerable uh, capability. Um, the RS-26 will replace the uh, SS-20 as a long-range uh, strike missile. If they put it on a rail mobile launcher, it'll be completely out of any arms control constraints unless they agree to a treaty amendment. Um, in the case of, of the cruise missile, uh, I mean, uh, you're talking about um, uh, a missile that, you know, Russian sources say uh, has a range of uh, mainly, they're mainly in the two to uh, 3,000 uh, kilometer uh, range, you know, uh, category. So basically, you're, uh, you're talking about something um, that can target half of Europe um, from particularly if they forward deploy it in, in uh, Kaliningrad. Um, and uh, there's, you know, if the um, the Iskander M ballistic or semi ballistic missile uh, really has the ranges that are that are being reported in in the in the Russian media up to a thousand kilometers, um, you've you've got a, a recreation of the um, the shorter range INF uh, missiles. So you put all that together, it's essentially as if the INF treaty um, doesn't exist. Uh, that's a, I think, a major, um, you know, military threat, particularly in the context of the near denuclearization of uh, of, of Europe uh, due um, to uh, the INF Treaty and and the uh, the presidential nuclear initiatives, which pulled back the vast majority of U.S. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons. We're down to a fairly small number of. Uh, uh, gravity bombs, and, and uh, they're being carried by, uh, at least for the next uh, uh, 12 uh, years, they'll be carried by planes that are not, st not stealthy. So you don't have much in, in, in the way of any, any, any real countervailing uh, uh, military uh, presence there. And what, you know, concerns me more than anything else about it, it's, not, it's just not the numbers of weapons, uh, it's the fact that they constantly talk about using these, the, these things. Um, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if, they, um, if Putin miscalculates and goes after the Baltic republics, we could be in a war with these guys, um, and they could very easily lose it. And uh, if they lose it, uh, I think they'll go nuclear. Well, and, because they've yeah. said in local conflict, our policy is to escalate to nuclear quick to, to de-escalate tensions. De-escalated conflict, they call de it. De-escalated yeah. conflict. Which is reality on its, still on its head. Uh, it's yeah, preemption. It, yeah, it, it might work that way, but <laughs> it also might work a very different way. And, and that's what scares me uh, more than anything else. Uh, 
that a, a uh, crisis could get completely out of hand uh, if they were to actually implement what they, uh, what they say they're going to do. Uh, and I, I worry about the impact on the Russian military because all they've heard for the last uh, 15 years uh, has been uh, every, every leader they have talking about using nuclear weapons. Uh, so that's got to influence the way they think. It's got to influence their, their war planning. Uh, and uh, that's very dangerous. Uh, and uh, uh, we need, uh, I think, enhanced deterrent capabilities. Uh, we need certainly to pressure them uh, to, uh, uh, to comply uh, with these treaties. And, and, you know, quite frankly, this is, uh, the cruise missile is, is I, I think, is clear material breach of, of the INF treaty as, as, as a, a, a number of, con uh, you know, congressional uh, committee chairmen have, have uh, written the president under those circumstances. I don't see anything, uh, any reason to, uh, to continue the treaty. We don't get any verification regime out of it anymore. That's long dead. Um, we, um, we will never think about seriously about anything uh, that violates the treaty, irrespective of, of what the cost effectiveness of, 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 of doing the same sort of thing is. But more than that, um, you know, I, I worry uh, that they, you know, really mean what they say. And they, they say it too often to, to just ignore the, that possibility that they really do believe they, they can, uh, they can uh, launch nuclear strikes at, at NATO members and, and as long as they're small scale and low yield, uh, nothing bad will happen to them and they'll win the conflict. Yeah, I mean, those stupid Europeans put ice in their vodka. <laughs> I mean, they're not worth much anyway. Um, one of the things that, that Mark said I think is worth highlighting, and that is those those items that are outside treaty constraints, one of the implications of that is that they could be sold. These could be, become a part of the new proliferation problem. It always made me crazy that the transporter rector launchers under INF had to be, you know, taken down to a degree that they couldn't be used for purposes inconsistent with the treaty, but if Syria had one of those transporter rector launchers for a ballistic missile, that wasn't a purpose um, inside, the, inside the treaty. So these things that are coming out without treaty constraints could be sold. Um, and the other thing that's related to what Mark said is, you know, maybe you talked about it before I, I got here, but they, the Russians have said for years that they wanted to withdraw from the INF treaty. Mm -hmm. Now, during the Bush administration, Steve Rodemaker and I were proposing globalizing the INF Treaty because we thought it odd that the only two countries in the world that, won't, that weren't permitted to have missiles in those ranges were the United States and the Soviet Union, so why not start pushing that? Um, what I'm, I'm especially disturbed, I think, um, the fact that Russia has now changed policy and is saying we don't want to withdraw from the ABM from the INF treaty because what that means is they don't have to bother violating if violating has no consequence you know you can keep the treaty and then let people quibble about whether or not it's a violation because there's no there's no consequence there's no impact and that is a very dangerous sign in terms of of their willingness to escalate and to, to do things that are, are really rude. Okay, I, I mean, I see the Crimea activity as being perfectly consistent with a pattern that has been developed since the reset. You go back and you look at that reset and then track Russian activities and they all go together. Let's take some questions from the floor. We'll start here. If you'd wait for the microphone. Go ahead. Right here in the green. Oh, thank you. Hello. This is a question about uh, U.S. intelligence on Russian missile program. The Soviet 
uh, military power, a document that you referenced, I wouldn't say has been widely discredited, but it did come up with some predictions about laser programs at Sarajevgan, uh, numbers of Soviet missiles being d developed during the period that we now know to be completely false. And we know that, uh, or not false, but, but two kilowatt lasers is not anything to go right home about. Um, so we rely on uh, OSINT from the Russian government. That's our only, cause, because of the level of classification and from the Russian press, right? When Shoigu says we have hypersonic, or Shoigu says we don't have hypersonic missiles in June, June of 2013, and Putin six months later says we have hypersonic missiles. This is another example of how, not unreliable, but how the, the dialogue shifts and how, Russian government might be unreliable to to use as a final word. So, so as far as like the evolving, how how good is our intelligence, you know, judging from those statements in the Russian government than it was in the 80s? Would you say? Thank you. I I am currently reliant on Russian statements because I'm not working in the federal government. I don't have all my clearances active, and so I have no intel briefings. Okay. Um, I think it's of concern that our intelligence focus on Russia obviously has been on a steep decline for more than a decade um, because we had other priorities that we needed to do. But it is not the case that the U.S. government is, is simply reliant on open source from Russia. Um, and as far as uh, Soviet military power, I think that those things that didn't happen that were projected, I think in many cases it was the effect of good policy on the part of the United States. Um, pressure on them not to do investments in those areas. Um, and resulting in, in a time when they were coming back into compliance and not investing in actions that would be very provocative to us. Um, of course, they kept their Moscow ABM system, which had nuclear warheads, so they didn't fix everything. <laughs> Mark, any comments on where we get information on Russian military development? Again, I, I, I wish we had something um, equivalent to uh, Soviet military power today on, on the Russians as a sanity check. Um, uh, on uh, what they're saying. I mean, I don't accept everything they say uh, uncritically. Um, the, uh, the, I think they're not telling the truth 100% of the time, but uh, uh, if you study uh, them for, for long enough, you, you develop a feel on, uh, on who um, uh, is accurate, who tends to be accurate, who, who tends uh, uh, not to be. Obviously, uh, I mean, I can't comment on, on, uh, on uh, uh, what sort of intelligence we have on, on the Russian now, a uh, Russian act now, because it's obviously very highly classified. I, I can say on the INF issues uh, that the uh, during the exchange uh, between uh, Brian McCannon and, and uh, Senator Wicker, um, uh, 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 it, it was uh, released that uh, a letter had been sent uh, uh, to uh, the staff of, of the Armed Services Committee that was top secret code word. Obviously, we're not making judgments um, um, uh, about Russian compliance based on open sources. I mean, I, I'm speaking on the basis of open sources because I can't speak on the basis of classified information. For one thing, uh, I haven't had any for, uh, for the last three years, and even if I could, I couldn't uh, use classified uh, information in, in a public presentation. Personally, I, when I uh, started seeing uh, one report after uh, another uh, on the uh, cruise missile testing to prohibited ranges, uh, I thought that this was quite credible because I couldn't conceive of any motivation um, on the part of these uh, Russian publications and Russian authors to fabricate stories uh, like this. Uh, and uh, there were too many of them, and uh, they were too consistent uh, over long periods of time um, about what was uh, going on. And it turns out, based on, on the, you know, the New York Times um, story that was confirmed by the State Department and, and the, uh, the exchange um, 
um, statements by uh, Brian McCannon in, in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, that those those reports were true. I mean, in, in, in certainly in the broad substance, if not in every particular detail, uh, in, in terms of particularly uh, particular detail, they, they varied uh, somewhat. But all of the ones that I've cited in, in, in some, uh, some of my publications uh, have uh, uh, consistently talked about uh, Russian activity going back to 2008 uh, that, uh, if true, would have been um, consist inconsistent with the INF Treaty. And I think that that's uh, now pretty much been, uh, been confirmed beyond uh, any, uh, any reasonable doubt. Uh, I expect that in, in the longer uh, run, we're going to have uh, less and less uh, free discussion in, in Russia, and we'll get less and less uh, um, of uh, intelligence value out of it. But I still think right now um, that what they are saying, uh, both officially and what's appearing in the Russian press, uh, has some uh, significant uh, value in terms of uh, um, assessing uh, what what they're doing, and uh, as I said, I I I would I would much prefer um, uh, to have something like Soviet military power as a sanity check uh, on what's what's going on. Um, the uh, the cla uh, the classification of almost all of the uh, New Start MOU data was a serious mistake. We should have never have agreed to something like that. Uh, and uh, it uh, makes it more difficult to evaluate what's uh, substantially more difficult to, to evaluate what is going on uh, uh, in Russia today. But it's, it, you can't uh, just ignore this, and it's the, um, uh, the best we got. Okay. Other questions from the floor? Let me, let me just say that, you know, the, the Obama administration has not issued there, I guess it's due in April, with the compliance report. And presumably, now that it's public, they'll go ahead and have a section on the INF treaty violations. Um, it, the, the law that requires these compliance reports specifies they're to be provided in an unclassified form to the maximum degree possible. Just because, I mean, there have been I could count on one hand the number of compliance issues that we've only kept at the covert level because the intelligence was so fragile. Um, you can say the United States has observed activity of concern with regard to the, the Russian cruise missile. We are observing it. We have seen in the Russian press, and this is where you can use the open source materials to try to, which, you know, if you know what the, the classified data is, you'll know what unclassified data to pick, and you can use that to flesh out your analysis to help the public and, and members to understand what the problem is. So they should not get a pass on not doing the, the compliance analysis. And frankly, the past three reports that they've put out, um, the compliance reports say, and they blame me, okay. Oh, we could we can do this for a long time because they hadn't done one for years. Okay, which is true, we had, I hadn't issued one for years. And um, we had to just do all this work to try and do it. No, when I left the State Department in January 2009, we had a compliance report that was just about ready to go out the door. The reason it took them a couple years to, to issue it is because they were taking all the intel and analysis out. <sighs> um, but that can be done. And they should have done it. Instead of putting in the compliance report that um, we have not met with the Russians in the what is it? SVC, Standing Verification? Special Verification. Special Verification. We have not met with the Russians in the SVC for a number of years. October 2003. Okay. Now, a reasonable reader would say, well, if they haven't met with the Russians in the SVC, that must mean that there are no INF Treaty compliance issues, because if there were, that would be the first place they would go to have these conversations. 
That was misleading. The second year, and the previous report that, that I had done said, you know, we don't have any current compliance issues on the INF treaty, because we didn't. The next year, they had the same language in their compliance report. And this past year, it, there was a, a slightly different wording. But in every case, what they've tried to do is communicate the false idea that there were no ongoing compliance cases. They knew that there were compliance cases. And yet, they didn't bother, and they misled Congress and the American people by putting in that, that language. And that's wrong. Uh, this is Brian M M McKeon. McKeon. He, uh, when he was testifying, he was staff director for the National Security uh, Council staff being nominated for the position of Under Secretary of Defense for policy. And he said uh, in February 2014 in front of the Armed Services, Senate Armed Services Committee, quote, we are concerned about uh, Russian activity that appears to be inconsistent with the INF Treaty. Uh, we raised this issue uh, with the Russians. The Russians have come back to us with an answer, um, which uh, we, we do not consider satisfactory. And uh, we've told them that the issue um, is not closed. Uh, in his testimony, he also indicated that in September um, 2010, uh, the Senate um, committees had been informed of a potential INF and a potential uh, New START treaty violation. We still don't know um, what the uh, potential New START uh, violation is. Um, if you read the um, noncompliance reports um, on the INF section, uh, um, they said nothing in, in the first one in 2010. Uh, they, for the next three, uh, they had the same language in them, uh, which uh, said we haven't had an SVC uh, session since October 2003, and no issues were raised during this um, uh, reporting period. Uh, as during Paula, the reporting period. Yes. That's, that's the last one. Yes. As, and, as, and so then you have to go to a footnote to find out, well, what's the reporting period? And it yeah. was just the reporting period ended just before Rose raised it. Yes, that's, that's in the last report. But yeah. certainly creating the impression that there were no INF um, uh, treaty compliance issues uh, when uh, you had already informed uh, the, the Senate that there were uh, is blatantly misleading in my, uh, in my view, and it's intentionally uh, uh, misleading. Uh, technically, what they said um, in the, uh, I guess it was August 2013 uh, report, uh, was correct. Uh, there had been no session since 2003, and, and uh, we hadn't raised anything in the reporting period, but they didn't <laughs> mention the fact we just raised something about two months prior, and that something was pretty significant. Uh, so, I mean, that's, this is, uh, I think, um, um, we really need a, a Reagan era uh, noncompliance report or the, you know, the equivalent of what Paula managed to get through the State Department uh, with a lot of... Uh, uh, welts or, or maybe bleeding wounds uh, <laughs> as a cost of getting that report out in, in 2005. Uh, there wasn't exactly uh, a, lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of support in, in the building for putting out a report that was uh, accurate on what, of what was going on. Unfortunately, it was just a snapshot in time uh, that uh, it didn't talk about things prior. It didn't obviously talk about things in, in, in the future. So uh, we don't have uh, a really uh, good um, uh, database um, on, on what's actually been going on in, in compliance um, after um, the uh, Reagan and the first uh, George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, the reports have been, uh, at best, with the exception of the 2005 report, sporadic in, in terms of the unclassified treatment and, and, uh, and in some cases, extremely misleading. Let me just, before we break, let me ask, do people have access to the compliance, the unclassified compliance report starting from 84 all the way up to the future? The, really, like the 84? One, one or two of the reports are on the, on the internet. I think the, uh, one of the uh, two, uh, 1985 reports and uh, one of um, 
also there's also a declassified, originally secret, uh, do a presidential yes, document on on this that's that's available on the internet. Okay. But, uh, it's not until um, I guess about 1995 that uh, you 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 actually can go to the State Department website and, and read the reports. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon to discuss these very important developments. If anything, the, the events in the last several weeks uh, indicate that our uh, shifted focus away from Russia may have been premature. Uh, there are a few reports over here on the table uh, that you may find of interest. Uh, they consider Russia's missile defense and space development programs. I encourage you to take copies of those. Thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking Mark and Paula for their fine presentations. Thank you.